Welcome back to Euro 96 and to London. Another rest day here in this tournament. The semi-finals, of course, kick off on Thursday morning, your time. In the meantime, more of the history of these championships. We'll take you back now to Euro 92, the last edition of this tournament held in Sweden. The Swedes, of course, would love to have won it, but they didn't. The title, in the end, belonged to a fierce rival. This was a real Hans Christian Andersen fairy tale for Denmark. The ninth European Football Championship opened with less ballyhoo than is usual for international sporting events. But with political turmoil and civil war afflicting the continent, such restraint is no bad thing. Indeed, the Swedish hosts have announced that small is beautiful will be their slogan. It's a phrase that could apply to Frenchman Jean-Pierre Papin, one of the best international forwards. Scorer of nine goals in France's faultless qualifying run, he is a clear threat to Swedish hopes in the opening match. But the Swedes make a bravura start, forcing the French to retreat. Limpar's 24th minute corner is perfectly driven into the flight path of Jan Eriksson, whose height and power turn the ball into a guided missile. Sweden lead 1-0. French manager Michel Platini, the best European player of the 80s, feels the impotence of life on the bench. The Swedes are determined to hold their lead. Papin must be snuffed out. So even their own star forward, Thomas Brolin, is drafted in to help. And Papin becomes Lapa, a rabbit to be torn apart by the pack.
Martin rages in the Anglo-Saxon he no doubt picked up from his Marseille's teammates Waddle and Stephen. second half he finally escapes the snares and traps to run free at last and the goal is taken mercilessly at 1-1 both teams have the point they need to keep their ambitions alive In the same group, England play the first match against a Danish team hastily recruited to take the place of benighted Yugoslavia. If England thought they had problems with injuries, what price Denmark? Their home base players had only just finished the season, while most of their exiles had been recalled from the Mediterranean beaches. For a while, the contrasts in preparation stood out like a sunburnt nose. Merson goes close with a self-made chance. like Poulsen, neat and alert, stirs memories of Simonson, Eljar and Michael Laudrup, three sticks of Danish dynamite from 1980. And soon England's predictability in midfield is alarming the team striker in chief. Manager Graham Taylor begins to look anxious. As well he might, with Denmark's impressive left back Henrik Andersen barnstorming into the attack. By early in the second half, the Danes were beginning to shake the sand from their boots. An exquisite move left Jensen clear to beat Woods only for the woodwork to make the save. Obliged to make chances for himself, Lineker tried to discover if Schmeichel was back from holiday. The answer, only just. The game ends goalless a result felt most keenly by the England captain. Still one short of equalising Bobby Charlton's scoring record, Gary Lineker knew he was within earshot of the final whistle of his international career. In Group 2, the world champions Germany set out to add the European title to their sideboard, backed by noisy and ever-confident support. Their first match against the CIS presented bizarre extremes of the New World Order, a united Germany facing the crumbling association of republics which were once the Soviet Union.
Germans lack the most unifying ingredient in midfield, Lothar Matthäus. The diminutive Thomas Hessler would have to fill the vacuum left by great man's injury. the Germans might have had about the CIS's lack of morale were soon demolished. A hard tackle hurts whoever's doing the kicking. In the general melee, the Germans lost their veteran striker, Vola, with a broken arm. Stefan Reuter lunged at Dobrovolsky like a Saturday night drunk. The German sense of purpose seemed somewhat mislaid. Dobrovolsky dusts himself down, then sends the ball east and Ilmer west. The CIS lead 1-0. Germans pressed furiously for an equaliser. All seems lost until Doll, once an East German international, caught a distinctly unfraternal shove from his former comrade Kuznetsov. With less than a minute remaining, the Germans have only one chance to find their way over a different type of wall. The Thomas Hessler produces a shot of stunning accuracy and pace. 1-1. save themselves and celebrate their great escape. of relief fuel the German fans' expectations of an easy victory over their next opponent, Scotland. Not that the perseverous and good-natured Scottish supporters could ever be said to be short of bottles.
their team were a different matter. A whole host of Alamos littered their recent past. In their first ever European Championship, could they find a Davy Crockett to lead them to the wild frontiers of success? Having lost narrowly to Holland in their first match, the Scots were expected to play for the safety of a draw. The Germans soon discovered otherwise. <laughs> Coach Andy Roxborough had demanded new levels of commitment since the nadir of their Costa Rican defeat in Italia 90. The Scottish captain, Richard Goff, became the first candidate for the raccoon skin hat. Bildner tips over the header. Then McPherson, his partner in defence, gets into the act. The Scottish fans acclaim this spirited assault on the world champions. Among a welter of chances, the best falls again to McPherson. But his instincts are to prevent goals, not score them. Wave after wave of Scottish attacks were finally beaten off by the Germans. Klinsmann's tenacity sets up a shooting chance for Karl Heinz Riedler. For the Lazio base striker, such riches are a rare treat after the suffocating efficiency of Italian defences. For once, a Scottish goalkeeper is blameless. Gorham would have needed a guide dog to see the shot coming. The Germans take a one-goal lead into the interval, which is increased by a deflected shot, as cruel as any the Scots have suffered. now employed as a full-time attacker. hang on for their 2-0 victory. Scotland are eliminated. But the reaction of the fans shows what most professional managers refuse to acknowledge. That irrespective of results, spirited performances can be cherished. As a reward for their marvellous attitude, the Scottish fans duly won UEFA's Best Supporters Award. In their final group game, the Germans faced the Dutch. A defeat for either team could still see them overtaken by a CIS victory against Scotland. This scenario added barely needed gunpowder to an already combustible rivalry. In short, here at last was a game which really mattered to both teams.
Hessler for one would find his Liebenstrom restricted by Hulet and Reichstag. The Dutch, anxious to atone for their defeat in the last World Cup, threw themselves at a German defence weakened by the Scottish attacks. Truman's precise free kick and Reichardt's elastic leap quickly exploit Germany's aerial vulnerability. After just two minutes, Holland lead 1-0. now back to full fitness, pushed hard into the reshuffled German defence and produced another free kick. Time surely for the sort of rocket which Koeman produced for Barcelona at Wembley. Instead, it's Witschke's daisy cutter which confounds the Germans. 2-0 to Holland. rampant now. Frank Reichardt, persuaded out of his self-imposed international retirement, looks every inch the complete player. Van Basten was even prepared to help out in defence, resulting in an uncharacteristic foul. In every element of the game, Holland seemed abnormally competent. During the respite of half-time, the news that the CIS were also two goals down to Scotland buoyed the Germans into their first serious attacks. Van Basten, it was showtime. Until that is, the steel-hearted Kohler decided to intervene.
from Hessler's corner, Klinsmann soared to thump a classic headed goal. 2 1. This game was not over yet. The veteran Dutch manager, Renus Meekel, scrutinizes his team for signs of weakness and typically brings a forward, Aaron Winter, on for defender De Berm. The versatile right part moves back to cover. Hessler's shot is a brief moment of alarm before Winter's run and precise cross feed Burkamp his second goal of the competition. Three one to Holland. German efforts were to little avail. At the close, the Dutch celebrate an emphatic victory in an enthralling game. Whilst the Germans must say danke to Scotland. over Denmark had taken them to the top of group one and local expectations had risen accordingly. Needing a victory to be certain of progress, Graham Taylor shuffled his limited pack into an attacking formation. Indeed, if Bernie the Rabbit had brought his boots, he might well have got a game. For Lineker, the issue had been reduced to basics. Just give me the ball. With Webb and Daly on from the start, and Platt pushed up to be his third striking partner, Lineker's hopes for an historic goal were high. But in the third minute, he was happy to play goal maker, as his careful cross was turned in by David Platt. burdened by his imminent move to Juventus, now remembered what pleasure a goal can bring. This was a much more positive England, and had Daly crossed more carefully, there might have been two happy endings to this game. At half-time, with the Danes leading France 
England were theoretically at the top of the group table. So much for the theory. Swedish manager Tommy Svensson sent on another forward with pace, Johnny Ekstrom. Within five minutes, Sweden were level. England's weakness at corners was readily exploited by Ericsson. England couldn't say that they hadn't been warned. Sweden, urged on by a Viking roar of the English bull by the horns. The supply lines to Lineker have been cut, and his exasperation is clear. Taylor decides on a switch. For Lineker, it is the end. With wretched irony, he is replaced by Alan Smith, a club mate at Leicester from his teenage days. Now, after 80 England games and 48 goals, so many of which prove vital, and a glorious record of sportsmanship, Gary Lineker retreats with typical grace. An England win would prolong his career, but a substitution so crass in spirit has no tactical value. The Swedes have seen the flag of surrender and the pressure is on. A brilliant Swedish move started and finished by Brolin kills England off. go through to the semi-final. England go home with one goal, two points and a manager apparently intent on reverting to the artless lottery of the long ball game. Lineker may well be glad to miss such a future. The Swedish team stayed on in Stockholm to face Germany in the first semi-final. Could the pride of being host country carry them over this last formidable hurdle to the final itself? The Germans were in no mood to oblige, and having seen England's fate, went for an early kill. When Ericsson toppled Riedler, on the edge of the box, the stage was set for Hessler and his party piece. Blinded by the wall, Ravelli has no chance. Ten minutes gone and Germany lead 
This time, Ravelli's problem is too few defenders. In the 58th minute, Sweden's defence is unstitched again. Hessler's seeing Samus run, and Riedler's seeing the cross. 2-0 to Germany. Sweden, there is nothing to lose in all-out attack, especially when referee Lanesi encourages them with a penalty. To the disbelief of Bremen. strokes home the spot and performs his usual victory pirouette. At 2-1, even German managers start to worry. With two minutes left, Helmer's astute ball finds Riedler to beat Ravelli. The Lazio forward will hope for a similar service from Paul Gascoigne. German fans celebrate the least surprising football news. Their team is in another final. In the second semi-final in Gothenburg, Holland found themselves facing Denmark. While Group 2 had finished as expected, Group 1 had been turned upside down by Denmark's 2-1 defeat of an abject French side. From sketchy beginnings, the Danes have progressed into the big picture. Thousands of fans have taken the short ferry crossing to lend support to this most unlikely momentum. The Danish players took their hint and flew into instant attack, just like the team of the 80s. Brian Laudrup, who, unlike his more exalted brother Michael, had settled his differences with the team coach, began to show their family skills. His perfect cross finds the Dutch defence dozing and Hendrik Larsen storming in to give Denmark the lead inside five minutes. After 23 minutes, it was no surprise that Vichka's deep cross should be delightfully laid off by Reichardt for Bert Kampf to score his third goal of the championship. The 
shot seems to find a full-sized hole in the goalkeeper's body. If Holland expected the natural order to be restored, they were soon denied such complacency. Nine minutes later, Poulsen's run and cross ping-pong round the Dutch area before Larsen strode up to thump his third goal of the tournament. Audacious Denmark were back in the lead, 2-1. With just five minutes remaining of normal time, Holland force a corner. Bitschka's kick takes touches on Bullet and Van Batten before finding Reichardt, the third member of the Trinity. And the ball becomes a stake to the heart. Long. Surely they cannot hang on. The finalists must be decided by a penalty shootout. While this element is much criticised, it remains at least a footballing solution to a footballing conundrum. At its heart, it is a test of nerve, skill and reflex. Not least for the Danes, who lost the 1984 European semi-final on penalties to Spain. Koeman will shoot first for Holland. 1-0. kick goes in off the gloves of Van Breuklin. 1-1. One, one. Now it's Van Basten, yet to score in the tournament, but still one of the world's great strikers. But Schmeichel guesses right and dives left to save. After two successful kicks for each side, it is three all. The pressure builds. Vilford, who had already been home to attend his leukemia-stricken daughter, such circumstances render penalty shootouts a triviality, shoots next. 4-3. If Vichka misses the Dutch are out. 4-4. The shootout must go to the last of the ten kicks. of the Danes, but Ullit and his compatriots can take pride in their performances, which win them UEFA's Fair Play Award. While Schmeichel dreams of greater victories,
To complete the pre-match atmosphere, Kelly saluted the crowd. The greatest footballer in the world had announced himself as a 17-year-old to Sweden in the 1958 World Cup. 34 years on, he's still a beacon for the game. would allow. But there was a sense that the Danish dream could not last, least of all against the tournament-hardened Germans. But Schmeichel conjures up the magic to transmit confidence to his team. the Germans who produced the first error. Bremer allows Vilfort to rob him. And Poulsen is set free with an impotent back heel. Poulsen's pullback is perfection. John Jensen's blistering shot puts Denmark ahead. Not bad for a man who scored only one goal in his 47 previous internationals. whips up the Danish support, as if that were needed on this incredible ride. Goalkeeping of this caliber breaks the spirit of opponents as much as any goal. Twelve minutes left, the Germans cannot get the ball out of their half. Christensen heads on to field for He threads his shot in off the post. Joy indeed for a man living through such terrible times. Denmark lead 2-0.
At the end, Denmark are the champions of Europe. Perhaps it is fitting that the Small is Beautiful tournament should be won by the smallest nation competing. The program was brought to you by Ericsson Mobile Phones and Optus. Sydney United travelled to Canberra without skipper Tony Popovich, but still confident that they could add to their six consecutive wins. Michael Garcia was an early threat to the plan. His positive run created a chance for Paul D, who obliged with an opening goal. Kalats was the busier of the two goalkeepers. This time, Peter Bullion was applying the heat. Shortly afterwards, Kresimir Marusic kick-started his team. His deflected shot fell perfectly for Ante Milicic to notch his fourth goal of the season. David Drillich was always on the lookout for a chance to add to his goal tally, his luck deserting him in the first half. 